Today we're beginning a new series, and we're in the book of Judges, and we're starting with Judges chapter 1. And, uh, and the title of the series is called The Dawn of Justice. Uh, we're going to be looking at, contained in the pages of God's Word, where are all the heroes? Do y'all want to try to play that? No, they're not going to play it. Forget it. Anyway, we're trusting the Lord that uh, your heart will be encouraged and blessed as we talk today about the dawn of justice. Have you ever thought about what's happened to, to all our heroes? Uh, and honestly, today, are there any heroes left? You know, you look, you look on the uh, society today and you, you see what we've got representing us and you see even in the ranks of Christianity, we used to have some heroes and it seems like those heroes have passed off the scene. Unfortunately, the 21st century has defined heroes by insisting that they are celebrities or athletes or movie stars. And that's become the mentality of heroes in the society in which we live. But what happened to names like George Washington, Patrick Henry, Abraham Lincoln, and some of the great names that we have read about in the pages of history? And then within the ranks of Christianity, people like D.L. Moody and uh, Ironsides and, and, and some of the other great names that have uh, stood for the, for the Word of God and has proclaimed it with clarity, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I mean, we, we've had some tremendous heroes in the ranks of Christianity that uh, paved the way that we could take the truth of God's Word and continue to carry forth that message. I think about even in the elements of Thomas Edison, uh, some tremendous names through history that basically have faded into history and no longer exist. But as we begin the book of Judges, we're going to find something here very important. We're going to find the nation of Israel in a similar predicament because it seems like all their heroes had passed off the scene. Men like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, and Joshua, all these great names and who were the headlines of who's who in the kingdom of God. Great people of influence, men and women, who were tremendously used for the kingdom of God. Uh, the people are beginning to forget their rich history. That's just what's happening to Israel. We have already forgotten our history. I mean, we have totally pushed aside all those who helped to pave the way for the greatness of our nation. Scripture tells us that Moses died while leading the Israelites to the promised land. And of course, Joshua took up the mantle and Joshua was instrumental in uh, leading the children of Israel into this great place. And he would provide the leadership for them to enter into this glorious land that God had prepared for them called the promised land. Now, when we enter Judges 1, Joshua has died. One of the greats now is off of the scene. And a new generation begins to arise that's forgotten the heroes of their past. And unfortunately, not only did they forget the heroes of the past, but they forgot the God those heroes represented. Now, the heart of the book of Judges it's actually, we step forward a little bit into Judges 21 and 25. And it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, do you see a similarity in our culture, society today, as to what was recorded here in Judges 21? I do. More absolutes had begun to disappear. Uh, the people were determining truth for themselves. They just basically did what they perceived was right, whether it was right or whether it was wrong. They just did what they perceived that they wanted to do. And of course, that sounds so familiar with what we are facing in our society today. We too have forgotten the God who made our nation great. We have forgotten the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've forgotten his precepts, his truth, his word. We've cast those things aside for the things of the world. Truth in the 21st century is no longer an objective standard. Uh, and most people are simply doing 
what they perceive is right in their own eyes, which unfortunately is not right, but is sinful and disrespectful and dishonoring to God. In the book of Judges, we find a tragic picture of what is happening in our nation of America today. And let's establish this fact. America is not God's chosen nation. Some people think that America is the apple of God's eye. It is not. Uh, Israel is the chosen nation. The Jews are the chosen people according to the pages of God's word. So America did not birth a Messiah, but Israel did. And not only that, the similarities though, we find Israel and America there are striking similar similarities today in the United States cycle of sin that seems to jump off the page as we read this book. I mean, we read about the sins of Israel and the chosen people, and we see so much similarity within the ranks of the people of America, just not today. This is not something that just sprang up over the last year or two. This is something that's been building year after year, generation by generation. A total, complete disregard for God. Our sin cycle is reflective in, of, of what happened so long ago. What we read about, God has given us a precious word today for an example that we don't have to make the same sinful mistakes and, and uh, commit the same sins that people committed in this Bible and turn from God. These are warning signs. These are things that tells us to prepare to meet your God. These are things that tells us that we should have a clean life, a holy life, a prayer life, a dedicated life, a scripture-centered life, that God is first and foremost, that we are part of his kingdom, and we are living like kingdom people. So God is looking for people today that will take the values, the standards of his word, and employ them in their lives. Uh, it makes no difference whether anyone does it or not. The fact is, we are responsible to God that we live a holy life to the kingdom of the Lord. So to, to surmise what I'm saying here, I believe that America is in trouble. I believe our nation is in trouble. I think we're throwing all our marbles in the circle thinking that a politician come uh, November is going to be the key in the, in the inauguration on January the 20th of the next year of 2017 is going to be the solution and the answer. For No, I'm telling you, we're totally missing the point. Our solution, our answer, is found in this book called the Word of God. And it's found in the author of this book, who is Almighty God. And if we could get back to this, if we could just get ourselves back to this, we could make a tremendous impact that would impact our families, impact our community, impact everything about us. But we've got to be totally surrendered to the Lord. We've got to be dedicated. We've got to really, you've got to put on your battle gear. You've got to put on the whole armor of God. We watched that movie last night, War Room. What a powerful movie. Oh, we need some war rooms too. We need our closets of prayer. And we've got to realize today, the devil is not passive. And he's just not sitting on the sidelines watching the parade go by. He is raining on the parade every sin and degradation and shame that he can to destroy the moral fiber of people and this word and who we serve. But I'm glad he doesn't have the final word. And I'm glad in the final chapters of the closing book of this Bible called Revelation, he does not even appear. And guess who does? Our God does and we do. And he is a defeated foe. So thank you, Lord, this morning for the victory that he gives us and I believe that our economy today is in one of the greatest states of being unstable that it has been in in years. You know, we look back to the depression of, what was it, 1920? I wasn't there. But, uh, but it was a horrible time. Well, we are in a depressed society today, economically speaking. And national security has been compromised. I mean, they can't even take a cell phone and break a code in it. Yeah. Our public education system today is brainwashing our children with everything that's unholy and unstable and does not give them values in life that they need. Worst of all, the political realities is this. It's just not that, but it's the spiritual condition of our nation. Our nation has basically shamed the very name of Almighty God. 
So the traditional biblical values, which includes and incorporates today things like morality, that really made our nation a great nation, has been contaminated and challenged by the things of the world. Now, marriage has been redefined by activists, which I don't, I, I don't, go, I don't go along with what they're saying. I don't go along with what the Supreme Court voted to do. I believe today that marriage is between a man and a woman. And also, we've come to the place of no-fault divorce. I've never seen so many divorces, families splitting up. After years of, of seemingly marriage and happy homes, then Satan gets right involved in that marriage and splits that family and that relationship and destroys it. And then we find ourselves in positions that they're unfaithful spouses. The guy that you married or the gal that you married several years ago, what happened to your love? It's because you got God out of your life. That's what happened to your love. Amen. Human life is now discarded in the name of convenience and in the name of profit. And they can say what they want to, but Planned Parenthood is a major corporate under that guise and under that banner, and they are taking money hand and over fist through the federal government and they are paying for the uh, abortion and then laundering of the body parts of those babies. How do you think God feels about that? I think God is sick of the condition of our nation. Moral absolutes are being replaced by public opinions. And all the while, the church, in most places, is becoming increasingly cold and forgotten God. It's, no, it's not relevant anymore. The preaching of the gospel is not relevant anymore. The proclaiming of salvation by grace through faith. The living a holy life for the Lord today is no longer the message of the church. And I fear that we have forgotten where we came from and the God who made us a great nation. That's why we're in the condition that we're in. If things keep progressing and keeping on the same course that are on, we might have to change our national bird from the eagle to a buzzard. <laughs> because that's about where we have come to. Part of the problem just doesn't lie at the door of unbelievers because, you know, we're quick to say, boy, the world is in a mess and all these crazy politicians in Washington and all these people who are running for office and all these conditions of our nation and all these people that are living in sin. And then here we sit. And I believe today the problem doesn't, just doesn't lie at the door of the unbeliever. I think primarily the, the, the blame lies at the door of the church. The rebellious cycle that is found in Judges is not found in, is, is not found in our nation. I hate to say it, but it's found in the churches that are filled with God's people where seemingly the fire has gone out and people have no longer in any regard for the things of the Lord. Matthew 5, 13 through 15 says, You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, Wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Now those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. For most Christians, the light has gone out. We no longer have that power of God in our lives, and the salt has lost its savor. And what happens then, we're found useless in society. There's a transparency. The church, the people of God, are just like the people out there in the fields of sin. And we're trying to bring the world into the church to make it more appealing. You can't do that. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. Salt not only today um, preserves, but it also irritates. And we need to be trying to irritate the devil on every corner of life that we come up to. We need to live a holy life. Christians in America have compromised so much that basically many are beginning to question whether America or, or ever was a Christian nation at all. I'm sorry, our president is totally wrong. This nation was founded on biblical principles of God's word. And there's still a, a fiber in this nation that still believes there is a God and the salvation is of the Lord. And Jesus died on a cross. He arose on the third day. He made a way for sinful man that we could have life and have it more abundantly. 
So I believe, and let me tell you what, this nation may be seeming to be taken over today by the occultists and by the Muslims and everything else, but let me tell you what, us Christians are still on planet Earth, and we still have a message, and we still have a story, and we still have a God, and we're going to proclaim that message, and we're not going to deviate from that. I have... Uh, you know, we, we've forgotten Proverbs 14 and 34. The word says, righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach, meaning it's a disgrace to any people. See, sin is the culprit. Satan is the deliverer. And therefore today we've fallen prey to his devices. The challenge of the book of Judges is not primarily a warning to our nation at large, but the challenge is mainly a warning to what we would say individual Christians. So it's, it's a warning that moral, de moral decline does not happen quickly. As I said earlier, it's a gradual, subtle process. And, and God's people slow, slowly start to, and here's a key word that's happening in the ranks of the church, they begin to compromise to the culture that is around about them, and therefore they then basically fall by the wayside because then compromise, well, let me tell you what the Word says about that. The Word says, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Christian people are supposed to be holy, sanctified, set apart, Holy Ghost filled. We're identified with the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. We need some godly heroes today that are willing to swim against the tide of adversity today and stand true and faithful to the one King, and that's King Jesus. Amen. Regardless of what the world does, our declaration should be, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Never compromise your faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Never today buy into this world system. Stand firm, stand true, remain faithful, serve the Lord, trust Him in all things today. So how, how do you be that kind of person today? You said you're preaching, you're giving us all these things today about not compromising your face, the condition of the world, all these things. How can you be faithful in a way today that really God wants you to be? How, how, can you, how can you today be the next hero that this world needs to see? Well, preacher, I'm not really anything big. I mean, I just live an average life, live in an average house, drive an average car, you know, have an average income, and I just kind of get along, go along to get along. I'm just kind of hanging in, hanging on. And you know what? You let the world condition you today. But you know what God said that you are? He said you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a child of the living God lives within you if you're born again today. So you're just not an average citizen in an average nation. You today are of royalty. You are identified with the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. You are kings and priests in his sight today. So it's time we start living up today to what God has said that we are. And stop living today the mundane, substandard life that the world has told us that we are. What we find in the book of Judges, his ordinary people that God uses in and an extraordinary way. He wants to use your life extraordinarily today. And you may think today, and see, your mind becomes one of your worst enemies because you start thinking about what you're not. You need to start remembering who you are. And you need to remember who you serve. And you need to remember who's on your side. And you've got to remember today where you're going. And you've got to remember until you get there, God wants you to walk the life and the walk and the path of walk today that will honor and glorify him. Never compromise your faith. Now from Judges 1, there are three uh, practical steps that we're going to look at and examine this morning. First step is simply this. Be committed to resisting compromise. That's a subject that I'm just not hearing in the ranks of Christianity, the church today, that word compromise. Because, unfortunately, so many people are compromising and going the other direction. And how they justify doing this in the name of Jesus, I really don't understand. You know, well, you've got to live in the times. You can't be an old fuddy-duddy. You can't live in the past. I'm not an old fuddy-duddy. I'm not living in the past. And, and, folks, God's given us today everything that we need in his word to live a godly life that will honor him and he'll bring a blessing. In Judges 1, 1 through 18, the people of Israel are fighting against the Canaanites. Now, let's capture a picture of what's going on. And, and driving them out of the promised land. I mean, they're doing exactly what God said to do. Get in there, dig your heels in, fight to win. Don't give up. 
And so God blesses them for refusing to compromise. God has always blessed when his people refuse to compromise. That's one of the key blessings of God today is you don't compromise, you stay true to the Lord. Whether it's convenient or not, God's not concerned up today about your comfortableness in life. He's concerned about developing your character to make you a strong and mighty Christian for the cause of Christ. So the Canaanites were wicked people and the judgment of God had fallen upon them by the means of the nation of Israel. They were doing what God said to do. You never go wrong when you do what God says to do. So the Canaanites were a picture of a godless culture that surrounds us today. I mean, if you, if you study the Canaanites, you'll see a carbon copy of our society, our, uh, of our culture that we're living in today. Judges 1.1 1, 1 says, Now after the death of Moses, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? They, they're seeking obedience to the Lord, and they're asking the Lord for direction. Listen, when you ask the Lord for direction, he'll give you that direction. And your roadmap through life is right here. Hallelujah. Everything that you need to understand and to do is contained in the pages of this book. The problem is we keep this book in this position closed more than we do open. So Paul said to Timothy, you've got to study to show yourself approved unto God. Study what? You've got to study the Word of God. And you've got to meditate, as David said in Psalm 1, on the Lord. And he said, when you meditate, when you study, when you receive, when you absorb into your spirit the Word of God, he said, you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Your leaf will not wither. Listen to this. And whatsoever you do shall, what? Not fail, but prosper. Amen. That's God's prescription. So why do we not receive it? So they're seeking God in obedience. They're seeking God. They're not compromising. Now, what is a key weapon here for them? It's prayer. Prayer is a key weapon by, in maintaining a spiritual balance today in a godless culture. Man, prayer touches the throne of God. And God hears our prayers. As a matter of fact, Paul said, just pray without ceasing. Be in a framework and a mentality and a spirit of prayer everywhere you go. Just pray, 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 pray now. Pray all the time. And God hears the prayers of his people. It, it, it is prayer that will keep you focused today on the priorities of God. Because God will reveal through prayer what he desires to do in your life. It's prayer that will help you today to even resist temptation. Submit yourself to God today and you can resist temptation. And you don't have to fall prey. You don't have to be running back to God every time you turn around. Sorry, God, I messed up here again. Forgive me. And you know, you could stop this cycle of sinning if you would just get in a place today of having the spiritual balance of godliness and focus on the priorities of God for your life. That's going to go against your flesh. Your flesh is going to want to do it the flesh way, the world way, the convenient way, the easy way, the shortcut way. But God has a higher way. A greater way, and his way is the blessed way. Amen. So it's prayer that will help you today to resist the temptations of this world. And it's prayer that will give you the strength that even when you're weak, he will build you up and strengthen your life. It's prayer where you will discover the wisdom and the direction of God for your life. Because, you know, Jesus, or rather uh, James said, if you lack wisdom, ask of God, he will give it to you liberally and upbraideth not. And if you're going to resist compromise, I'm going to tell you what you got to be. You've got to be a prayer person today. You've got to pray without, well, I pray when I come to church. No, you, this is the easy part, praying here. I mean, get down and pray, man. I mean, pray to God. Call on him all day long. Go to your closets of prayer. Pray beside your bedside. Pray over your job. Pray over your family. Pray over our church. Pray over our nation. Pray about everything. Even pray over your food. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You wouldn't have so much indigestion, maybe, if you did. <laughs> Judges 1, 2 says, And the Lord said, Josh, uh, Judah shall go up before I have delivered the land into his hand. Now, God designates the tribe of Judah to lead the way. The people believe God. Hear this. When they believe God, then they acted upon what God said. If we believe, hear me. If we believe God, we will act on what God says. See, when you don't do 
what God says. When you're continually sinning and you're continually going the way of the world, you're not believing. You can say, I believe by words, but your spirit says, I'm in rebellion and I don't believe God. See, your actions indicate where your heart's at. Your priorities are where your focus is at. So we need to take God's word at face value, and then we need to act on it. You can't rationalize. You cannot manipulate. You can't twist this to fit you. You've got to take this, apply it to your life. And you know, sometimes, man, this word hurts. Sometimes this word will cut. Sometimes this word will cause you to bleed. But man, let me tell you what, there's a bomb in Gilead for every cut and every bruise that it puts on you, there's a healing that comes from this word to strengthen your life. Amen. I can almost preach this. We need to take God's word at face value and act upon it. We, we don't have to apologize for what God says. We don't have to say, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you know, well, don't get mad at me now. The, the Bible says, all who have sinned and come short, you know, they're sinners and they're going to hell. I'm sorry to have to tell you that. Why are you apologizing for telling the truth? I mean, you can tell people the truth and you can do it in a way, but you've got to be direct with God's word. You can't pacify sin. You can't pacify compromise today. We don't, we don't have to apologize for what the word of God says. Take the word of God at face value, believe every word of it, and proclaim that word through your living every day. <laughs> it's very simple. Read the word and seek to live by it. It's that simple. Why do we complicate it? I don't know. How can you say you believe in the Bible when you never open the Word of God and read it? I wonder how much time you, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I wondered last week, let's draw a, a piece of paper, to draw a T on it. Let's put TV on one side, Bible on the other. Now, if you had to go back and write down every time that you watched TV last week and every hour, whatever, you watch it and you put that in one column, and then you wrote in the other column how much time you spend in God's Word, would there be any balance? I mean, would it even be equal? I would dare say it probably wouldn't be. Because we spend more time on the world's stuff than we spend on God's stuff. Amen. Judges 1 and 3, And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. So two tribes of Israel get together to even actually be more effective as, children, as Christians today. Let me tell you something, folks. We need to work together. We're not an island within ourselves. We have got to work together to do the, the work of God. Amen? So Judges 1 and 4 says, And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered by the Canaanites and the Perizzites into the land, into their hand, and they slew of them uh, Bezek, 10,000 men. If we will do what God says, you know what God will do? He will add the blessing. You know, there's so many Christians, I talk to people every day, they're walking around, they just can't understand why they're not blessed. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you ask me why you're not blessed, I'm going to tell you why you're not blessed, because you're not living for God. There's a guaranteed process here. You live by the word, you're going to be blessed. If you don't live by the word, you're not going to be blessed. I mean, that's pretty simple, isn't it? But it's profound. And it's exactly the way it is. So Judges 1, 6 and 7, and uh, Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him and called him and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. In other words, they cut off his thumbs and cut off his big toes. Now, you try to do something without your thumbs. How do you hold the fork? How do you hold the spoon? How do you hold the knife? You can't do it with these. It won't work. So he lost his thumbs. So all he's got is four fingers. Man, it's hard. I mean, thank God you got those, but that thumb is a, he's a key character, isn't he? Same thing. In your balance, cut off your big toes and see when you stand up, check your balance out. You, you're going to find yourself kind of fumbling and falling around some because it's an element of balance. So here's the bottom line. What happened to them is the same thing that happens to us. You reap what you sow. Amen. The matter of fact, the Bible says, if you sow to the wind, you reap a whirlwind. Amen. So our responsibility today is not to determine that, the outcome, but to, to sow righteousness today and to be the light of God's word to a nation that needs to hear about how great our God is. In verse 8 and following, Israel continues to fight against the Canaanites in the places where God basically gave them instruction to do so. And in verse 8, they take Jerusalem. 
And we find in verse 9, and I'm moving forward here, uh, they battle in the countryside. Verse 10, they are victorious at a place called Hebron. In verses 11 through 15, they're captured, uh, they captured Debir, D-E-B-I-R. In verse 16, they inhabit the desert of Judah. And in verse 17, they destroy Zephath. And in verse 18, they took three other places. Now, the point of all this is God was with his people. See, when God's with his people because people obey him, then you will refuse to compromise with the instruction that God gives you. The battle is always won when, listen to what I'm going to tell you, the battle is always done when it's done God's way. Amen. When Christians live out their faith, they not only today honor the Lord, they also are good for society. So look at our society today. So what's the evidence, Pastor? Oh, yes, the world's bad and all these evil people. No, look at the evidence today. Christians are not living out their faith. That's the problem. We need to live out our faith in a pagan world. It looks hard being a Christian. Who ever told you that? When God gives you everything that you need, he will enable you and empower you, and he's on your side. My Lord, if, he, if God then be for you, who can be against you? you? You'll have greater influence as a Christian today if you refuse to compromise and stay true to the word. Hold your life up to the word. It's the mirror that reflects what we are or who we are not. But also let the word purge you and cleanse you and purify you today. Vance Habner said, it's better to die for a conviction than to live for a compromise. So be committed to resisting compromise. Let me give you the second thing. I don't know if I'm going to finish or not. Be concerned about uh, rationalizing compromise. So in Judges 1.18, the Bible introduces a gradual deviation from God's instruction. And the people begin to rationalize compromise and they start justifying what they're doing. So God was with them, but they were unable to drive out the Canaanites in the valley. And then Judges 1.19, it says, And the Lord was with Judah and, and behaved out of the inhabitants of the mountains, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. So let me say, the church does not take its marching orders from Washington. We don't take our marching orders from we are to render unto Caesar. We are to obey the laws of the land. But let me tell you what, when those laws interfere and are in conflict with the word, you better go the word way. I'm not telling you to go out here and, and uh, misbehave. But I'm telling you today, you need to go by what God's word says. Just for an example, our Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage. Just because the court and the government now condones, sanctions, and endorses that, I don't. I go by what God's Word says. If God created Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve, I think he knew what he was doing. And we need today to go with what God's Word says. So we need to take our marching orders from the Lord. They allow themselves to be intimidated by the culture around them. You know that is so prevalent within the ranks of the church today. We are intimidated by the world. They took their eyes off of God and they focused on the enemy. And folks, rather than defeating the Canaanites, they rationalized living amongst them. And let me tell you, God has never sanctioned and never will sanction his people compromising. In Judges 1 and 21, and the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell, in, dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto that, this day. And so in, in the verses following, they made deals with, with Canaanite men, a uh, Canaanite man, and they kept compromising and compromising, and basically the, the paganism invest, in, invaded into the ranks of the, of, the, uh, of the people of God, the Israelites, and it destroyed them because now they are embracing compromise rather than embracing God. So you need to be uncomfortable today. Listen, you need to be uncomfortable in this world in which we're living. This world is not our home, is it? Amen. I, I even believe that you need to be uncomfortable in church if you're not right with God. I believe we need to hear and heed the Word of God. 
Rather than reaching the culture, we're beginning to just act like a bunch of, a pack of dogs like the culture of this day is acting like. And folks, listen, politicians are not afraid of the church because the church honestly has lost its backbone. And we no longer stand for the, the pages of what God's word says. God will not only forgive you, though. I'm glad today he will change you from the inside out. I'm glad he is a forgiving God who will forgive our sins and wash away every iniquity and he will refresh us. I'm glad even in the face where we have spit of God today, I'm glad there's a merciful, giving, forgiving God who will forgive our sins and restore joy and restore life unto our nation, unto our churches, and unto our homes. But we've got to come the way of God, don't we? The Bible today instructs us today. The world today is saying you cannot... You cannot do away with, with abortion because it's about women's health. No, it's not. It's not anything to do with that. The underlying meaning is it's big business and it all employs money. That's what it's all about. Same thing with pornography. Pornography is destroying families, but also it's a big money industry today. You would probably be surprised. I don't know how many, but I, you'd be surprised how many people in churches are hung up, tied up, and consumed in pornography. Folks, these may be the national trends. It's not ours. Amen. You can't rationalize sin. You can't endorse sin. You can't compromise with sin. And the last thing, I'm going to give this to you real quick. Be convicted of reflecting compromise. Judges 129 and following, we find the compromise spreads just like a cancer will spread and destroy. So after dwelling with the pagans, they begin acting like the pagans. See, that's what happens, and that's what's happened in the ranks of the church. So as I told you a moment ago in 2 Timothy 3 and 5, Paul said, having a form of godliness but, de but denying the power thereof. Well, then what does he say? From such turn away. Amen. So sin will make you careless with your Christianity. You cannot practice sin and live the Christian life that's honoring unto God. Amen. Our hope lies in the fact today that we serve a forgiving God. You know, every person that will fall before the throne of God and plead the blood and ask for forgiveness, I'm glad God will forgive. And he will restore. And folks, we've got to get back to God. That's, that's the major issue today. And as I close today, I'll tell you this. You can be a hero of faith. You really can. Every one of you in this room, you can be a hero of faith. God can take you in your ordinary state and develop you into something extraordinary for his kingdom. But you've got to do it God's way. And his way is still the word. And the church said, Amen. you said, preacher, this is going to be a rough study. It all depends on how you look at it. I see it as good. Amen. I see God wants to develop some heroes that are sitting in these pews right now. You may not feel like a hero, and you may not look like a hero, but let me tell you what, in God's eyes, he's already declared you a hero. Now start living by this and live up to the hero standard, and you will be a hero for the kingdom of God. Thank you, Father, for your mighty presence. You're tremendously good to us, and we thank you that your mercies endures forever. We thank you that, Lord, you're a God of grace. We thank you that you're a God who loves us with an everlasting love. I pray now, Lord, as we enter into a season of worship this morning, Satan has just tried to invade our ranks today and create problems with our screens and our computers and all these other things, and it's aggravating. But, Lord, we worship you, and we're not dependent upon any mechanical device. We're only dependent upon the Holy Spirit to move and work in us today. Have your way, touch, Lord, and bless, and pour out your grace and your goodness upon us. We magnify your name, we worship you, we declare, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lord, have your way here today, and we're going to praise you with the depths of our soul and say, to God be the glory. In Jesus' name, and all God's servants say it, amen. amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise today. <laughs>